Thank you. <clears throat> um, it is really a pleasure to be back. Um, I see lots of faces that I've taught. Um, and don't worry, there will be no cold calling today. So you, you need not to. I, we can do it if you really want to, though. So uh, it's, it's, it's not a difficulty. And uh, really, I am simply overjoyed not just to be here, but to be away from Europe right now. Um, it was a fraught week. OK, um, so I'm going to take a sort of different tack on the Great Recession, um, the 2008 crisis, um, uh, from what Laura di did this morning. Um, I'm primarily an international economist, and um, I'm not a member of any administration in any way, shape, or form. Um, so um, I'm allowed to be a little bit more skeptical. And um, let me also say that, that part of the, the purpose of this talk this morning is not just to be informative about what, what it is that we know about the most important economic event of, of our lifetimes, probably of three generations, um, but um, to, to show you some idea of um, what sort of research is being done at, at the Haas School and more generally on the Berkeley campus right now. And um, you know, what, why it's, it, it, I know it sounds really awful, but why it is that we rely on, on alums and, and, and important um, um, constituencies like that to support our research, why we think our research is actually important. OK, so that, that, that's the, uh, the motivation. OK. Um, oh, you should feel free. As always, if you've ever taken a class from mine, you know that I encourage interruptions. So feel free, and in, in, so like, just because you ask me a question doesn't mean I'll answer it. Um, but uh, feel free to ask or to, uh, to make a point. Um, that's going to be especially important here because the answers to many important questions about this defining event are simply unknown at this point. And, and that's something that's actually not usually recognized nearly as much as it should be. OK. so. Um, most recessions acquire names, OK? And um, this one is known as the Great Recession, OK? And that will probably stick, because this is really, in some sense, the most important macroeconomic event for probably not just the decade. So that, that's me being conservative, because I presented this talk at the, um, at the Central Bank of Denmark last week and the, and the Central um, Bank of uh, Europe the week before that. Whoops. Um, but really, it's not the defining event of the decades. Probably the defining event of, of three generations. Okay, um, you can already see that it's changed form dramatically in the last year. In fact, in the last few months, um, about a year ago, a um, little bit more than a year ago, it really looked like private sector demand had just completely disappeared all over the um, the world, but especially in the rich countries. Okay, um, now. It's transformed completely to um, um, shift gears. And, and the big issue right now is in the public sector. And the big fears, especially over the last couple of weeks, have been um, primarily focused in Europe that um, the public sector has taken on an excessively large role in fighting the recession. You see that most dramatically in Greece, which went to the IMF formally yesterday. So we'll, we'll talk about this. But, um, Really, the Great Recession that started in late 2007, really early 2008, is going to be a huge thing for the rest of your lifetimes. Okay, and many implications that we we don't really begin to understand. It affected almost all countries in the world. In fact, if you were in a country that was not seriously affected by the Great Recession, you were in either a trivially tiny country or one that had essentially no integration, no relationship with the rest of the world. So North Korea did really well through the Great Recession. <laughs> so, um, OK. So this was a, a very unusual downturn. It affected essentially all the world. OK. Until the Great Recession, all of the previous business cycles had been regional in nature. So for instance, in 1994, there was a Mexican a crisis, a big serious um, issue in Mexico that affected a bunch of countries in Latin America. Um, in 1997, there was a crisis that we know as the Asian crisis. These were small regional crises that typically affected only developing countries. This one affected everyone, essentially at the same time, which is extremely unusual. Usually, um, people date um, the, the, the serious onset of the Great Recession of 2008 to September the 15th, 2008, which was when Lehman Brothers went under. Okay, so this one you can date to almost the minute, which is just extraordinarily rare. 
that almost all countries go in at this, the, the same time. It was a very deep recession, deepest recession in 70 years, very long recession. Um, and that's an extremely important issue for many countries, um, especially those facing um, serious political uncertainty, such as right now the, the, the big battle line is in the UK. The UK is fighting an election right now, and, and a lot of it is over the recession, who's responsible for it, and who will um, steer the economy best on the way out. So a very unusual recession. Please work. OK. Um, as a result of this great recession, there are enormous policy um, debates going on. You see that in the United States. OK. So right now, the Senate is, is um, debating, or trying to debate. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Some fraction of the Senate is trying to debate. <laughs> some fraction is trying to stop debate on uh, financial reform. OK. So for instance, um, let, me, let me just um, list six big policy initiatives. But there are only six, and, and, and there are many more. Um, new capital requirements. OK. So um, many people think that the banks were undercapitalized. Or um, macroprudential um, capital regulation essentially says that during good times, banks and other financial institutions, especially the shadow banking sector, should have higher capital requirements. So that's what macroprudential is. So, so you run up your capital um, ratios during good times so that you can run them down more effectively during bad times. Okay. There is another idea, um, which was um, most recently promulgated by Paul Volcker, the ex-chair of the, uh, the Federal Reserve, which is that institutions, especially banks that are too large to fail, that have systemic risk, should be broken up. Okay. And that is a much debated issue, um, but it's being taken seriously in some places in the world. Um, there are all sorts of new regulatory forms, such as um, organizing derivatives um, on, onto markets instead of making them over the counter. Um, most dramatic, especially if you watch TV, especially cable TV, are the limits on executive compensation and bonuses. Um, the IMF and the international financial institutions are really into developing early warning systems. So macroeconometric models that will sort of start to flash red, as it were, if there's a particular issue um, in some sector of some economy. So that, that's um, um, just a short set of the uh, policy debates that are, that are going on right now. OK. The question that I want to ask is really, in some sense, hopefully more fundamental than the, the policy issues. Before you can address policy reforms to fix a particular problem, you have to be able to identify the source of the crisis. Okay? So you don't want to treat just the symptoms. You want to try and treat the underlying causes. Okay? Um, so the question is, what do we know about the actual um, causes of the crisis? The crisis was very widespread, as I've said before. It hit essentially all rich countries and many developing countries. Um, but it didn't hit all countries equally. And we can measure the intensity the severity of the crisis across countries relatively easily. Okay, and I'll show you how to do that um, in, in just a little while. Um, it did not affect all regions of the world equally either. So two particular areas, there's East Asia, which, which was particularly hard hit um, initially, especially because of its trade linkages. And what used to be known as Eastern Europe, um, and, and many Americans would still call it Eastern Europe, um, since you're in Berkeley, you should know that that is now politically incorrect. It's called Central Europe now. Okay, so you, to be in Eastern Europe, you, you have to be behind the vodka line. Just for, for those of you who don't know such things. So Eastern Europe, so um, the Baltics, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. So Latvia, very very hard hit. Um, Hungary, the Ukraine, places like that were extremely severely hit. Okay, and the question is why? Okay, so the fact is. The crisis hit different countries with different levels of intensity. Okay? Can you line up the intensity with which countries were hit with potential causes? Okay? You should be able to do that if you have a view about what caused the crisis and therefore what policy reform is appropriate to deal with that, that problem in the future. Okay. So the objective of, of the research that I'm laying out for you is to line up across countries potential causes of the crisis, of which there are zillions, and I will mention quite a few, okay, with the manifestations. Any good theory of the crisis should be able to explain not just its incidence in the United States or in Germany or in Japan, but across a whole range of countries. Okay, so that's the, uh, the idea of this research. 
Okay, so um, what I'm going to do, again, as, as I've said, is do what's known as a cross-sectional experiment. Compare the cross-country incidence of this very dramatic crisis to potential cross-country causes of it, okay? And um, let me go into that in a little bit more detail. But before I do that, I want to emphasize something that this is a very, very limited project in scope, okay? If you're looking back on the 2008 crisis, as I've been doing, as, as many people do, you know lots and lots of things that would be inadmissible to a policymaker in, say, 2006, looking at the, at the global landscape, trying to figure out, do things look good? Is there a problem? Okay, so we know right now that there was a crisis in 2008, okay? Policymakers in 2006 or policymakers today in 2010 looking forward don't know whether there's going to be a crisis. And in fact, one of the most serious problems associated with understanding crises or recessions is that there are many, many false signals. Okay? So Paul Samuelson, probably the, the greatest economist of the, of the 20th century, was famous for many things. One of his, his more favorite quips was, the stock market has predicted 11 of the last three recessions. Okay? And that's a standard thing. So, when you're trying to line up potential causes of, of the crisis with, um, with uh, uh, its consequences, you want to make sure that just because something is problematic doesn't mean it's going to actually show up in a crisis. There are many false positives. We know the timing of the crisis when we're looking back on it. But of course, in real time, when you're looking forward, you may think, well, look, there's a serious problem that's going to blow sooner or later. Okay, so for instance, we've known I certainly feel very confident in saying that we know that Greece has been a ticking time bomb, but that's been true for many, many years. Figuring out the timing of that is very difficult. Okay? Figuring out which countries are involved is, is very difficult. One last thing. Um, the crisis of 2008 was unusual because it was so broad-ranging across sectors of the economy. So it was a banking crisis. It was also a securities market crisis. There was serious volatility in the stock markets and especially the bond markets, okay? It was also a housing crisis in many countries. And in many important countries, it was also an exchange rate crisis. Usually, you treat each of those types of crises separately, okay? Um, and the diagnosis of each of those varies a lot, okay? So we know lots of information when we're looking back on the 2008 crisis that a true policymaker wouldn't have been able to Okay? And that's going to be important in trying to understand the efficacy of policy reforms and, and uh, early warning systems and, and the um, models of, of crises. Okay. Nobody's going to ask a single question? No, if you're just like my usual students. So. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. Um, okay. So I'm, I'm going to, um, um, in my recent data, uh, excuse me, in my recent research, I always try to look at a very large number of countries, and, and I guess I'm, I'm famous for knowing lots of obscure facts about very obscure countries. But I think of 107 countries as being a small fraction of the world. Um, um, but nevertheless, it's going to cover most of the world's GDP and population. So I'll, um, the data that I'll be showing you covers all countries in the world with um, GDP per capita of at least $10,000. Okay, um, $10,000 is a standard cutoff now because the World Bank says if you have um, $10,000 or more in GDP per capita, you're an upper middle income or, a, or a, um, an upper income country. Um, no one who, who does research um, in international economics relies just on countries that are upper middle income because it excludes China. And, and you always have to include China if you're going to do anything of relevance, especially for the crisis of 2008 where China was a very serious player. Okay? So um, I'm also going to include um, countries with GDP per capita of at least $4,000 um, so long as they're sufficiently large. They have at least a million people. Okay. Um, and in, incidentally, um, if you're interested in any of the underlying research or these slides themselves, they're all freely available on my website. Everything is always freely available on my website that, that I publish. Oh, please. Yep. Okay, so, I, um, well, the, the, the dates are actually on there. I was just about to go to that, which is um, for the um, manifestations, when you're measuring the intensity, the severity of the crisis, you restrict yourself to data from 2008 or afterwards, 
Okay, so um, I'll be I'll be looking at a variety of different things that took place over 2008, and that timing seems a, a, a appropriate because most people think that the uh, the crisis either started in December 2007 or January 2008. But if you're thinking about causes, you want to go earlier in time, and I'll be looking at a variety of different causes that have been mentioned at, or, or, or spoken of seriously by people, and the data for potential causes comes from 2006 or earlier. So they're separated by a complete year. So that's the, the, the actual timing. Okay. Um, all right. So how do you measure um, the, the, in, excuse me, oh, the incidence of the, of the crisis? Okay. Um, the most standard thing and that, uh, the one that, for instance, Larry Summers always likes to talk about, which is a, a completely reasonable thing, which is um, economic growth in 2008. So real GDP growth in 2008. And of course, the, the, the worse it is, the more serious um, a country was hit by, by the crisis. And that's a very, very natural thing to do. And so I'll be using that. But the 2008 crisis was primarily a financial crisis. So I will also be looking at data from three important markets, financial markets. So for instance, um, the stock market, which is um, the financial market's best guess as to the present discounted value of future real GDP, you look at um, the, uh, the change in the stock market over 2008, and some of those changes are extremely dramatic. Um, incidentally, if you think that America went through the ringer in 2008, really you have no idea what some countries went through. So a bunch of countries lost way more than half the, the stock market in 2008. Some countries did worse than that, and I'll, I'll show you evidence of that. So I look at the, uh, the change from um, January the 1st through December 31st in the stock market, the most um, aggregate measure of the stock market. So for instance, in the United States, it would be um, the S&P 500. That's the, the standard um, measure. Um, you do the analog for the foreign exchange rate, um, especially a um, uh, a multilateral level, um, measure of the, the foreign exchange rate, so the special drawing right one, if you're, if you're interested in that. So the change in the exchange rate over 2008. The last thing is, of course, bond markets were very seriously hit um, in 2008. So you look at a country's international credit worthiness. Okay? That's done by two trade um, organizations, institutional investor and also euro money. Um, each country in the world is ranked with a number from between 0 to 100, where 100 is the most creditworthy country. So Singapore and Switzerland are always very close to 100, and Zimbabwe typically is very close to 0. You look at the change in those creditworthiness rankings, country by country, over the whole of 2008. Um, so those are the, the, the ways to measure the manifestations of the crisis. Stock markets, bond markets, foreign exchange markets, three measures of financial markets, and one measure of the real economy, real GDP. Okay, here's what you see. So right at the, the top, you see the countries that did absolutely the worst. So by far the worst hit country, uh, with, without any comparison, is Iceland. Now, I, I guess technically speaking, I'm supposed to say at this point, I'm an advisor to the government of Iceland. Okay, although I've, I've never said anything of value to them, and I doubt that I will, but there, there it is. Um, <laughs> but I'm happy to talk more about Iceland if you want. Um, okay, so Iceland um, didn't do so badly in 2008 in terms of GDP. They, they only dropped 4.7 percent. Okay, so they've done much worse in 2009. Um, they lost 32.5 um, points on their bond rating, institutional investors. So, so they went from something in the 90s to dramatically lower. Okay, their stock market lost 90 percent of its value in 2008, and the price of foreign exchange rose by 90 percent. Now. If you've ever been to Iceland, okay, um, and in, I guess you can't go right now, um, and it's, it's the cause of all woe in the world right now, um, Iceland can pr um, basically produce only two things, okay, and they are herring and electricity, okay. Electricity, and, and the way they export their electricity is they make aluminum, okay, because aluminum, con converting bauxite into aluminum requires a tremendous amount of energy. So they import almost everything. When the price of foreign exchange rises by 90%, that means the price of essentially everything consumed rises by 90%, almost one for one, almost overnight. Okay? It was expensive before, and its level of, of expensiveness has risen very dramatically. Though, of course, it's much easier to buy Icelandic kroner than it used to be. Okay? Um, so Iceland was hit hardest. 
But the other countries that have done really badly are Ukraine, Estonia, Argentina. Argentina is always in terrible shape, and, and that's certainly true in 2008. Um, Latvia, the, the other near Iceland is Ireland. Okay, so Ireland went through the ringer. Um, Korea, New Zealand, the UK, and, and Hungary. So th there shouldn't be any real surprises. The countries that did really well, well, Poland did best. Okay, so Poland, very close to, the, uh, um, um, to some of the Baltics that did really badly. But then the other countries that did relatively well are spread out. So Thailand, the Netherlands, France, and so, so on and so forth. You notice the United States is not even on the list. It didn't do either particularly well or particularly poorly compared to many other, other countries. Okay. Um, now, that's the easy part. The question is, what are the potential causes of crisis? So just switching back, why did Iceland do so badly? Iceland, the Ukraine, Estonia, and Argentina, and Poland, Thailand, and the Netherlands do so well by comparison. Okay. Oh, please. Um, well, it did poorly com uh, compared to most other countries. So Technically speaking, the, um, the way you do this, the way these rankings are, 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 are derived, so these are actually ranked, but you don't see the, see the rankings. It's, you take um, these four different factors and squeeze them together using a statistical technique known as factor analysis, and that provides a ranking uh, but that combines all four of those things together, and that's how Argentina ends up top. But don't forget, they did lose 50% of the stock market, and they, they lost tremendously on the bond ratings compared with everyone else. So should look pretty intuitive. OK. Oh, please. This is great. I'm, I'm happy to take questions all the way. I hate hearing myself speak. Uh, great link. Oh, because it didn't do particularly bad or well compared to everyone else. Now, that was probably a result of the, the very large fiscal stimulus. Um, but you know the, the uh, exchange rate changed essentially not at all, because they fixed uh, um, uh, that. Um, their bond rating didn't really change very much. They lost a lot on, on the stock market. Their GDP growth fell somewhat compared to um, what it could have been. They're just a middling country. So, and, and of course, you know, most of the countries in the world are in the middle. So. OK. Um, what are the potential causes of the crisis? OK, well, let me just run through a large number that have been suggested. OK. Um, Many of the central bankers, especially the central bankers who arrived relatively recently, blame financial policies. Okay. Um, so for instance, Ben Bernanke, who I, I think in LA has done a spectacular job through um, the crisis, says basically, look, there were serious regulatory flaws beforehand that gave rise to the crisis. Um, so one of the things that's uh, taken very seriously is inappropriate incentives within institutions. That's the excessive bonuses. That's the, the fight about excessive bonuses. Um, but it may well have been the case that um, the capital requirements that were passed by the international um, institutions, such as the Basel uh, capital requirements, lend, it, um, lend, it, um, lend credibility to that. Many people blame the rating agencies for relatively um, slack performance and so forth. Um, there's a whole raft of, of, of uh, <coughs> policies, financial policies, that have been blamed as, as the ultimate source of, of the, the crisis. Well, here's the deal. You can measure essentially all of those. Maybe not perfectly, but pretty well. Okay, so for instance, the World Bank collects data looking across countries and across time on the ability of a central bank to <coughs> Um, restructure a, um, a, an insolvent um, institution, on the ability of the central bank um, to actually regulate capital, on the quality of its capital regulation, and so on and so forth. This isn't done just by the, um, by the World Bank, by the international institutions. The Economic Freedom of the World um, database, which is run by the Heritage Institution, a, a, a private, very right-wing institution, also looks across a large number of countries and say, says, how well um, do they manage their banking um, systems? So you can measure the quality of financial policies across countries. OK. Here's another set of causes that have been widely suggested, financial conditions. OK. So for instance, many people think that the um, underlying cause of the financial crisis was an excessive reliance on short-term debt obligations. OK. Um, and there have been many people, especially Americans, that have blamed uh, risky lending practices, especially associated with the Community Reinvestment Act. Okay? Um, leverage um, has also been thrown out as a very serious cause. Well, you can measure 
all of these things, perhaps imperfectly, but you can measure them. And let me just give you a, 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 a few. Um, many people think that credit was just excessively easy and excessively available, especially to households that, that just couldn't deal with it. So a standard way to measure the accessibility of credit is private sector credit given to the domestic economy measured as a share of GDP. And you can measure that relatively easily. Um, you can also measure the strength of banks um, in terms of giving those out by bank liquid reserves as a share of assets. The economist likes to say bank claims measured as a share of deposits. That's the single best predictor of uh, financial fragility. Okay? So there are many different ways of measuring that. Okay. Um, in America, we like to say that the fundamental cause of the um, crisis was the asset price bubble, especially the run-up in real estate prices that was widely viewed as unsustainable. Okay? Um, U.S. mortgage delinquencies uh, were extremely high, and um, they were highest in the, in the areas that had run up the most. So that, that's work that's done by a new colleague of ours in the, the business school, um, Atif Mian. Um, and in general, it may well be the case that excessive real estate appreciation also pulled up the, the, the stock markets, and that was the source of financial fragility. Well, you can measure the run-up in real estate prices, and you can do that for a bunch of different countries. It's, of course, even easier to measure the run-up in stock market values. Okay? And again, you can do that for a bunch of different countries. And then the question, you're, of course, you're going to ask yourself is, is it the case that countries with bigger real estate appreciations okay, had more serious crises, or the same thing for stock markets? Okay. Um, many people especially at the IMF now, believe that international imbalances, the so-called problem of global imbalances, was the fundamental cause <coughs> of the financial crisis. Um, and that's especially popular if you like to bash China and say that they're the cause of all evil um, in the world. Um, so it may well be the case that, 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 that um, you say, look, the fundamental problem was that China wanted to export its way to growth. And as a result of that, that, that drive by the Communist Party, they deliberately keep an undervalued exchange rate, and they acquire a huge number of American dollars as international reserves. And that's a fundamentally unsustainable thing. And in the meantime, they're exporting their capital to America, and that's driving asset prices in America up and creating financial fragility. Okay. I'm not a particular believer in that theory, but many intelligent people do believe it's true. Okay. Here's the question. Is it the case that countries that were exporting more of their capital to the United States, like China, did they have systematically different crises? Okay, can you actually tie this theory in the data to the intensity of the crisis? Okay, so that's the, the question I, I, I want to drive. Um, I, I want to drive at. Um, so many people believe that excessive international reserve accumulation by China was the fundamental cause of the crisis. But you can measure um, uh, international exposure, um, and you. It, <coughs> If, if, if it's true of China, that China is driving it, countries that are just like China, but not quite as intense, such as Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and so forth, they should also have had uh, relatively um, uh, similar manifestations of the crisis to, to that of China. So one of the things that I do is, is look at many different measures of the external position of countries and of their adequacy of their foreign exchange um, reserve holdings. Okay. Um, in America, um, uh, people like John Taylor, who's a famous macroeconomic professor at, at Stanford, believe that really the fundamental cause of all the woes is domestic. Um, and it's, it's all the, 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 the fault of Alan Greenspan. So the Greenspan put was the, was the thing that exacerbated asset um, price appreciation, excessively loose monetary policy in the United States during the run-up to the crisis, as far as they're, they're concerned, was the fundamental cause. Um, if you're a Tea Party person, then you believe that the, uh, there are probably not that many at, at, at Berkeley, but <laughs> you know, there, there are lots of them around. That, that's clearly the case. Um, if you're a Tea Party person or a relatively right-wing person, um, you believe it was lax fiscal policy, right? That, that there were large numbers of, um, of governments that ran very large deficits during the run-up to the crisis, and maybe that was the source of the institutional fr fragility. Please. Uh, when you're looking at some of the international um, uh, measurements, has there been any study as to um, the intensity of a crisis within a country 
based on how much they had invested, say, in the U.S.? Sure. I, I'm, I'm going to get to that in just a second. Okay. Um, okay. So it may well be the case that very conventional macroeconomic stuff of the sort that, 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 um, that we teach in the core all the time, macroeconomic, monetary, and fiscal policy, maybe those were the, were the fundamental source. And again, you can measure those relatively easily, especially on fiscal policy, and you can measure macroeconomic conditions. So fair enough. Okay. Um, just a, a, a few <coughs> things in passing. Um, people in the United States don't think that much about larger monetary issues um, in the sense that, 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 for instance, Europeans do. But one of the most striking things, um, especially to Europeans following the crisis, was that a bunch of countries that were inside the European Union but not inside the Eurozone were hit particularly hard. So for instance, the three Baltic republics, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, they're members of the EU and have been members of the EU for quite a while. Very sound macroeconomic policies in many ways, but they were hit particularly hard. They don't use the euro. So the question is, if you're a member, especially if, a, if you're a small country, that you're a member of the EU but not in, of the EMU, does that make you more vulnerable? That's especially important for understanding things like um, Iceland. So Iceland is not even a member of the EU, at least not yet. Okay, they want to get in as quickly as they possibly can, um, <clears throat> except for the fact that they collectively committed economic suicide last month by voting against a deal to settle their debt problems with the Netherlands and the UK, but we can talk about that later. Anyway, um, one of the solutions to, um, that many people propose um, to um, crises of this sort is joining together um, countries in larger monetary unions. So places like, for instance, Ecuador and Guatemala, which use the US dollar, did not have particularly severe crises, whereas countries like Argentina did, and they have their own um, currencies. So is it the case that countries that are members of larger currency unions okay, had less or more severe crises? That's, a, that's an interesting question um, for many um, countries in the world. Okay. Um, the, the sixth question um, was um, mentioned a little bit earlier, contagion. Okay. So almost surely the first country that was hit, and the most important economy in the world by a long shot is the United States. Okay. The United States was probably where the crisis broke out. Um, perhaps it's the case that exposure to the United States um, systematically affected a country's own crisis. So for instance, okay, I'm, as, as some of you know, I'm a, um, a Canadian, excuse me, a proud Canadian, same thing, okay? So um, um, <clears throat> Canada is very close to the United States. Lots of Canadian exports go to the United States. Maybe it's the case that Canada had a much more serious recession um, than it otherwise would because it exports a lot of its goods to the United States. When the U.S. goes down, the um, market for the, your most important and the vast majority of your exports is hit really hard and you import a crisis even though you didn't do anything of your own. Okay. So that's what's known as the trade channel for contagion. Okay. So maybe, maybe that's a, a, a big deal. And we know that countries that did a lot more trade were systematically harder hit. So for instance, um, trade um, just <clears throat> imploded, especially in East Asia. Maybe that was fundamentally because um, the United States was the end user of most of that trade. There was just lots of a very complicated trade associated with very long supply chains in East Asia. And when the U.S. went down, that just um, had dramatic spillover effects all over East Asia. So that's what's known as the trade channel. There's also a financial channel. The United States has the treasury bill market, and especially the treasury bond market. So we have this extremely liquid um, debt market. As a result of that, the United States can also issue the very worst debt. You know, all the toxic assets are disproportionately American in nature, and they're bundled up as um, mortgages, especially subprime mortgages. Those are um, a disproportionate amount of the toxic um, securities. Maybe it's the case that countries that have a disproportionate financial exposure to the United States were hit first, okay, and therefore they imported the crisis because they took this shot to their wealth when American debt markets froze up and the value of those securities plunged. Okay, so that's a, a completely different set of ideas. Okay, and incidentally, if you believe in contagion in a serious way, then the only solution to that is to isolate the fundamental source and to reduce international integration. 
Okay, so that um, if you believe in contagion, your solution to the, to future crises like this is very very different. Okay, so that's a um, uh, a different set of potential causes, and again, those are all easy to measure. You can measure exports to the United States as a fraction, for instance, of exports to other countries. You can also measure for instance, for a country like Mexico, or the UK, or Japan, what fraction of its external assets are held in America, or in American debt, or in American long-term government debt, because of very complicated and sophisticated um, data sets that are available. So we can measure exposure to the United States and to other countries um, very easily. So that's a way that you can test for contagion. Okay. Um, Good, good time to pause for questions. I, I've just gone relatively briefly over many, many different types of theories as to why the, the crisis spread the way that it did. I believe I've been comprehensive, but if you have suggestions or questions, I'm, I'm happy to take them now. Um, this please. seems to be like an overwhelming list. How, how do you narrow it down? Like, you know, where, where's the 80-20? Oh, I, I, don't, yeah, I, I, I don't believe in doing that. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so don't, I mean, Time for an academic is just a completely different concept. <laughs> <laughs> we don't do that. Um, no, and, and, and uh, gathering the data is not particularly difficult, and, and, and then processing it is even easier. So I, I, I'm going to look at all of them. So I, I've looked at, um, at this point, I think it's something like uh, over 95 different um, potential causes of the crisis to line them up with the manifestations. And it, please. What about the psychological factors and the, the, the the herd mentality at play, where does that factor in some of these causes? Not at all, right? I, I've got to be able to quantify it. Got to be able to quantify it. But, you know, when, when you're, you're thinking about things that, um, across countries, I'm, I'm not sure I, I, I think it's fundamentally different across countries. So the, the questions that we want to ask are something like, why did Iceland and Latvia and Korea do relatively badly and Poland and Thailand and France do well? And so you'd have to say something that's different about the psychology of the investors in, the, in those different countries. You'll measure behavior in response to some event uh, that makes things worse. That's what I'm kind of getting at. If, if, if you tell me a way to quantify it, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to look at it. But I've got to be able to quantify it. You know, it's, um, I, I've got to have data. I'm like Sherlock Holmes, right? I don't theorize without data. I, I, data first. OK, um, so let me, uh, l let me um, <clears throat> talk about, about uh, what you actually see. Okay? So the objective now is to try and line up okay, all of these potential causes okay, of the crisis with the, um, the actual intensity of the crisis, which is where I started. Okay. So the first and, and, and in some sense most interesting result is that this was an extremely progressive crisis. Okay? And, and that's a very, very rare thing. Very progressive country. The richer you were, the worse you were hit. Okay, uh, richer countries were were, were dramatically uh, more affected by by crisis countries, um, by the crisis. Um, and apropos, um, there's no effective country size. So some rich uh, some some rich countries were hit um, very severely, and many poor countries were not um, hit very dramatically. But bigger countries were hit just as, as, as severely as very small countries. So there's no effect of country size. Let me show you the effect of, uh, of rich countries. Um, look at the, uh, the graph in the, the top left and do not, I do have a point, sorry, okay. Um, it's we're completely invisible. <laughs> Although I can see it here, but <clears throat> you're not going to be able to see it. If you look at the, the graph at the top left, um, you'll see Iceland way down in the lower right corner. So Iceland's a very rich country um, and um, was hit very severely. Um, um, way up in the top left, um, the countries that were not particularly um, hit were Papua New Guinea and Kyrgyz, the Kyrgyz Republic. Um, and uh, well, although you may laugh at it, but especially this, this last week, it's a, it's a very big deal, um, especially for the, the war in Afghanistan. Um, but if you look at, 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 at that, um, <clears throat> that scatter of data, 
Um, it sort of looks like a little bit of a blur, and that's why it's um, it expanded, and, and, and I've, I've put in a, an actual slope in the other three graphs. But y there's a, a strong negative relationship. So richer countries, um, countries like Iceland, or you can also be, um, see Ireland, were systematically hit um, worse than poorer countries. So this was a progressive um, 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 crisis. Um, please. Yeah, so in understanding like what the model's uh, predictive power, so what's the R squared? How much can you actually predict? Pretty poor. Pretty poor. So I'm, I'm, I'm not finished yet, but, it, but it's poor. But that's an important fact. Okay, so that's an important fact because um, this says, basically, it's going to be really difficult if the fit is poor to predict which countries are hit by crises in the future. And that's going to be one of the things that I conclude, that, and that I, I believe very se severely, um, seriously, rather. So the, the, the poor fit is part of the deal here. OK. Um, all right. So um, <clears throat> the first thing to, um, to take away is that rich, richer countries were hit worse. OK. Um, and the three other graphs, um, without the, uh, the, the names, just show you that, that that result is sort of insensitive to the exact way you do this. Because as is always the case whenever you do any econometric modeling, there are many different uh, um, sets of assumptions that you have to build in. And you want to make sure, if you actually believe your results, to make sure that the exact um, conclusions are insensitive to tiny little econometric assumptions. Okay, so that's a, um, one thing. So um, what's the larger point? Well, I've looked at, again, over 90 different causes, and I've mentioned a large number of them very quickly. And I will show you evidence that says that very, very few of these potential causes that have been mentioned by all sorts of people um, ha are robustly significant and explain um, the intensity of the crisis. Let me give you an example. Real estate appreciation, which is the biggest thing in, 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 in America. So many people think that the principal um, cause of the crisis in America was the run-up in, in uh, real estate prices. So you might say then, look, countries that have more serious run-up in the real estate price and, more, and, and larger bubbles then had a more intense crisis. And that seems very logical if you're sitting in the United States, especially if you're, for instance, in Florida or in Southern California or just outside La Las Vegas. Okay, that, that makes perfect sense. But then you should be able to say, look, um, Germany had a very serious crisis. GDP fell almost seven percentage points in Germany. But Germany had, for instance, essentially no real estate bubble at all. Okay? How about Japan? Okay? Japan had a very serious crisis. GDP fell a tremendous amount. Real estate prices were falling during the entire period up to the crisis. Real estate, if you look across countries, um, real estate bubbles appear in some of the countries with crises and do not appear at all in many of the other ones. It simply doesn't line up. And I'll show you some graphical evidence of that. There's nothing special about real estate. Essentially, every other cause, with only a few exceptions I'll talk about very shortly, okay, do not line up consistently across countries. So countries that had more serious crises, like Iceland and Latvia and so forth, simply didn't have certain macroeconomic features that were worse than countries that had less severe crises like Thailand um, and so forth. Please. Due to the global nature of the crisis, is it the right measure to look between the correlation of how much the crisis appreciated, appreciated the local market? Because people in Germany may be invested their money in the US, right? So I'm just trying to understand whether that's the right Okay. To look at that. So, so the, 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 the point you're making is that it might be the case that national causes of the crisis aren't very closely associated with national manifestations of the crisis, which is exactly right, and that's consistent with this. But then we do know that there was a serious crisis. There has to be something that explains it. If it isn't the case that there's a national cause for a national crisis, then there's got to be some contagion of, of, of some sort. So, so the, the question then is, what causes that? And so that's the contagion stuff that I referred to. So just to make sure you all understand, here's, the, here's the, the basic idea. Suppose that I come down with some symptoms, OK? Many people compare business cycle recessions or crises to catching a severe cold, OK? So suppose that my nose starts to run tonight, and maybe I, I have a fever, and I feel sweaty, and I ache, feel achy, and so on and so forth, OK? And she has almost exactly the same symptoms, and perhaps it comes a few hours later, and then she has very similar symptoms maybe a few hours after that. 
and it follows a certain number of people in the classroom in a certain pattern at basically the same period of time. Okay, so that's very similar in a, in a medical sense to what happened to the world e economically. What could explain that? There are two different theories. Here's one. I caught a cold, say for instance, when I was passing through Heathrow on Thursday, okay, for, for some other reason, and I transmitted it to her by breathing on her, shaking her hand, and I've actually transmitted a bug to her. She transmits it on to other people. That's true contagion. If you believe in that, you have to cut off the source of the contagion. From an economic point of view, if one country goes into crisis and it's going to spread it elsewhere, you have to cut off the transmission of that. So that you want to reduce international linkages between countries to reduce the global nature of the crisis. Here's a completely different theory. A completely different theory says we're all in this room, okay? Something comes through the air conditioning system. We're all exposed to it. I come down with it first. Why? Because I traveled on Thursday and I'm run down and weak, okay? So I'm <clears throat> um, it, the, the same bug hits us, but I'm the most susceptible person. She's the ne next most susceptible person and so on and so forth. There's no physical transmission. There's no contagion. We just have different levels of susceptibility, okay? Um, that might also be the, um, the, the case, okay? But in that case, it's national causes. So let's think about lining that up with explaining the crisis. If you believe that national vulnerability, okay, um, means that you responded to some global shock. So on September the 15th, 2008, the entire world went haywire because we all realized that if Lehman Brothers can go under, everyone can go under, and the global appetite for risk just um, enormously diminished. That, 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 that's a reasonable um, story, okay? However, national institutions vary dramatically. That's the equivalent of national susceptibility, okay? That there seems to be very little evidence on, okay? Um, what about the, the contagion story? Well, I'm gonna measure the contagion story, and there also seems to be very little evidence of that, too. Okay, so that's a, a long-winded response. Okay, excuse okay. me, just a second. Please. Didn't, didn't uh, I think, I, I'm not sure, you, you would be the expert, of course. Didn't Spain and the UK and Ireland experience uh, similar uh, real estate crashes than that we did? Right, okay. so, so absolutely. So there were a bunch of countries, um, and if you look, at, for instance, just within Europe, about half of them had uh, pretty big real estate run-ups and then crashes, just like the United States did. Okay, and about half of them did not. So yeah, it, it works for about half the, half the countries in Europe. Okay, when you say it works, what, what do you mean by that? There is a big real estate run-up. Right. For, for instance, from the, the uh, best sample of period of time that it works for is 2003 to 2006. Okay. So for instance, in Spain, there was a big run-up in the real estate market and, and, and housing became a very large part of their, of their GDP. And then it started to crash and they had a very serious crisis. Right. Similar thing in the UK, similar thing in Ireland. That is certainly true. You just don't see that in, for instance, Italy, in Germany, in okay. France. And did, now, did, for instance, did Germany buy our toxic real estate assets? That, so that's, that, that, that I will measure in, um, when I'm looking at contagion. Okay, okay. okay. So uh, uh, it's a completely so legitimate. It could be a contributing point. factor there. Could be. Could be in principle, doesn't work in practice. Doesn't work in practice. Well, you haven't proven that yet, right? Have you, or? <laughs> no, that's what I thought you said. Yes, so we're going to test that. that. I thought that it's, that's what it's I an thought. eminently testable hypothesis. Doesn't work. <laughs> 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 that that, that I, I haven't I haven't proven it to you. And, and it's, you can never prove of anything. You can only disprove something. But there's no evidence of it. And there's lots of evidence against it. Okay. So let me go on. Um, let me sh let me show you some evidence. Okay. So. Um, um, I have four different manifestations of the crisis, okay? So in the, in the top left, you see um, measured on the y-axis um, the percentage change in the stock market in 2008, okay? Um, and on the x-axis against it is the standard measure, okay? Um, in this case, <clears throat> gathered by the World Bank as to the quality of the bank capital regulatory um, system, okay? So a higher number means that there's better regulation, a lower number means that there's um, worst quality regulation. And each of those circles represents one country. So you see that, um, for instance, you see um, 
Uh, Iceland lost 90% of its stock market and had a uh, bank, um, bank uh, regulatory quality system of seven out of eight. So this is not the highest possible measure, but the second highest measure. And if you look at the, at the, um, the correlation between the stock market change and the quality of the bank capital regulatory system, you see nothing. Okay, there's just a blur of points. How about the exchange rate change? Well, that's just beside it in the upper right. Okay, so you see that the depreciation against the special drawing right, that's a multilateral, a standard measure of the exchange rate, no relationship to the bank quality regulatory. Um, in the lower left is the quality of the, excuse me, the extent of the international bond rating decline. Okay, and again, you can always see Iceland very clearly because it's always the worst, right? So you see Iceland lost 32.5 points on its um, country credit rate rating and had the second best um, capital regulatory system. And then GDP growth rate, that's in the, in the, the bottom right. Okay, so there, there's just no correlation there whatsoever. Now, that's a very simple-minded just display of data. There's much more complicated econometrics, which you can just freely um, um, download from my website, or I'm happy to talk with you about it afterwards. So this is just one measure of a potential cause the quality of the bank capital, and, and in particular, the quality of the bank capital regulatory system. Um, there are some things that do explain why the crisis was more intense in some countries than other. In particular, countries that had a bigger stock market run-up before the crisis did worse during the crisis. Okay? So, for instance, um, Iceland had this tremendous stock market run-up of 200%, and it turns out that the best years um, were 2003 to 2006. So if you had a, a stock market that exploded from 2003 to 2006, you collapsed dramatically during 2008. So you see a negative relationship there. Same thing um, for um, the exchange rate and the bond market and GDP growth. So that's the thing that works best. Okay, so that's the thing that, for instance, the IMF is now pinning its hopes on. So if you followed what's happening with the IMF, they're trying to predict future crises through the stock market. In particular, a big run-up in the stock market, they don't think is a good sign, they think of it as a bad sign. Okay, so that, that, and that's coming straight off this, uh, this finding. Um, domestic credit growth. Okay, so many people, like for instance, if you read The Economist magazine, or if you're, if you're really rigorous about it, The Economist newspaper, as they, they love to refer to it, um, they think of domestic credit growth as being the, the key thing that triggered the crisis. And there's just essentially no relationship between the two. Please. With respect to the stock market run-up, is sure. there a certain delta that over the kind of long-term increase in the stock market that the IMF would term or sees as being a, a risky? I, I, the answer is I don't really know because um, if, if there was a particular level, they probably wouldn't say it out in, in, in public, right, because they're an intrinsically secretive organization. Um, but. I mean, they sort of have to be um, by, their, by their very nature. But um, this is just to scatter the data for you to, to, to take a look at. And it doesn't look like there's any obvious threshold level. You know, there, there's no obvious nonlinearity that you can see easily in the data. That, that's one of the nice things about graphing the data. Let me see. Okay. Um, so domestic credit growth. Um, the other thing that the economists like to look at is the, um, the ratio of bank claims to bank deposits. Again, no relationship. Um, here's the, 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 the data on real estate appreciation, which again, in, uh, you ask a typical American, they're sure the real estate appreciation was the thing that, that, that caused the crisis. It just doesn't work across countries very well. Um, bank leverage, um, the current account I, I mentioned earlier on. Um, I'm going to go through my results relatively quickly so as to, to leave time for, for some Q&A. Um, budget deficit, so again, if you're a fiscal conservative, um, is there any linkage between the size of a budget deficit before the crisis and the actual behavior during the crisis? The answer is no. Okay. So the results suggest very strongly that anything that you can easily measure before the crisis, from 2006 earlier, seem to have had very little common impact. And that almost no, none of these potential causes have had uh, robust um, effects on the intensity of the crisis, again, measuring across countries. You simply can't easily align any of these potential causes, with only a few exceptions like the stock market run-up, with the actual consequences of the 2008 crisis when you're looking across countries. Okay. And of course, that's a, a, a very disappointing result 
okay? And, and, and I, don't, I don't want to portray it any, any other way. I don't do research. I don't set out to do research hoping to find nothing. Okay? That's, that's, that's not so easy to sell. Um, but nevertheless... But you are looking for a silver bullet, right? Well, it can be more than one. It doesn't have to be a single one. So looking for a bunch, uh, finding a bunch simultaneously is absolutely fine. Sure. Uh, but it, you have a very, very difficult task to try and do that across the globe. Sure. That, 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 uh, absolutely. That's right. <laughs> like, you don't set off uh, trying to do small things. You set off trying to do ma major things. That's right. That's right. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Um, so so the, I, I, I guess the, the, the status of, of my view about where the research is at this point is it's relatively easy at this point to model the incidence, the intensity of the crisis across countries. Okay, but linking it to observable causes, other than, for instance, whether a country is rich, and and uh, its stock market run up is very very difficult and something that's beyond us at this point. Okay, um, and that's a disappointing uh, result, given that many many people have their particular th uh, pet theory as to the cause of the crisis, and since policymakers have to make decisions about how to reform the international system so as to prevent future crises, okay? Um, let me also just um, <clears throat> re uh, remind you of something that I started off with, which is all I'm doing here is trying to look across countries and ask, did the countries with certain conditions before the crisis do better or worse during the crisis? I'm ignoring altogether the question of trying to figure out the timing, when a crisis is going to hit, which is really important, okay, and much, much more difficult, much, much more difficult to do. Okay. Um, there are lots of reasons but why results might be weak, and I'll, I'm going to ignore that for the, for the time being because you, you know, this is a <clears throat> just um, cover your, your butt stuff for, for academics to, um, <clears throat> to ignore. So let, let me just conclude very briefly because I want to leave some time. Um, my view is, is that um, there's lots of caution that's warranted, and it is very difficult um, to engage in policy reform if one doesn't really understand the, the, the causes of the crisis. And my view is it's probably too soon to, to say with any confidence what a plausible cause of the 2008 crisis was, um, and therefore how to make sure that um, a, a similar crisis doesn't occur again in the future. And that's a difficult and, and, and in some sense, very negative conclusion. But it's also the reason why you know, universities like Berkeley and places like the Haas School um, should be encouraged to engage in ongoing research, right? Because really, these are first order questions. We simply can't say with any confidence that we know the answers to them. And that's why you, you, you need people to keep on working on these problems. OK, so we have a few minutes um, left. And let's uh, open the floor. So. Yeah. <coughs> Sure. Oh, you can do it. You can do all all of this stuff simultaneously. You don't have to look at the at the causes one by one. I've discussed them that way. But in the econometrics, remember you can uh, remember your your multiple regression stuff. You can include a bunch of different causes at the same time. There's no problem with that. No, no, that usually just makes things weaker. But there's no reason why you can't do that. And, and, and in fact, I have. So, please. Is this crisis unique and not having quantifiable causes, or is it common across all, even over time? Well, and since I mean, there's lots of causes that seem to be understood for the same for the Great Depression, but are those right. not quantifiable? They're just conventional wisdom. No, no for other recessions, that it, it, it's been much much easier to to do. So it could well be the case that this crisis is unique. Okay, and if that's the case, okay. Um, Trying to figure out and, and how to um, how to reform our um, institutions so as to prevent another thing, which is extremely unusual, is probably a, a, a wrong-minded thing to do, because if this is a once in three generations crisis, you know you don't design you d design your institutions to prevent that. Um, you you deal with it in a, in a more ad hoc way. So I'd be reluctant to come to your conclusion, but it may well be right. Um, and in that case, it's there, there's nothing more to be done really. So, please. And your, your study of, of the, the effects was based on 2008. Do you think, or do you plan to study 2009, 2010? Because com countries are coming out of this in very different matters. Yep. Wouldn't you expect that maybe some of the conditions 
that will lead to the acceleration for certain countries yeah. would help? Yeah, them? absolutely. And, and that, that is, in fact, what I'm doing right now. So the problem is that um, data, <laughs> even for 2009, is, is not available for many different countries. And you want to you wanna do it in a very comprehensive fashion. But um, that's what I'm actually going to be doing over the next few months. Um, it's a completely reasonable thing. But one of the advantages of using 2008 data is there were many policy responses that occurred that differed dramatically across countries. So for instance, in Germany, you had the Cash for Clunkers um, a program that was very successful and spread to the United States. Um, you have, in, for instance, the UK and the United States, you have the central bank buying long-term assets, which is very unusual um, without historical precedent except for Japan. So those policy responses are in 2009, but not really in 2008. Okay, so that's one of the advantages. Plus, the stock market and the bond markets are supposed to be looking forward. So when you look at what happened to the financial markets over 2008, they're supposed to be incorporating all future available information. That, that's, what, that's what we think financial markets are supposed to do. So I'm doing it. It's a reasonable thing. But, but looking at just at 2008 is also probably reasonable, too. Please. So basically, the research shows that the, the effects of the crisis were exacerbated particularly for rich countries and for countries that experience a stock market run-up. Right. So given that Greenspan had a monetary po uh, policy bias toward asset price stability, I mean, is there any conclusion prior to the crisis? Is there any conclusion we can draw in terms of maybe that's not <coughs> an appropriate monetary policy? Could be. I, I, I guess I'm unwilling to make that statement about the Greenspan put. I know lots of other people are, but I, I personally don't think that um, if you look across, for instance, different central bank governors or chairs of the Fed or different countries, you don't see systematic differences in asset price volatility when, when, when you look at Greenspan compared to other people or other countries. So I, I, I'm prepared to say that countries that had bigger stock market run-ups had bigger crashes um, later on, but I'm not, I'm not willing to characterize um, Greenspan's monetary policy that way. <coughs> it's, thank, okay, thank you. Okay, please. Uh, you opened your talk with, it seemed like the premise that policy that's being set in place now could be misaligned to the actual causes of the crisis. However, you did also talk about symptoms or manifestations of the crisis. Are you also looking to say whether the policy put in place to fix those manifestations even if they didn't prevent the crisis? How would, how would they? Well, I, so you, if you just take a, a derivatives market. Yep. If that would prevent, say, Lehman Brothers from failing, if it did, but didn't prevent the crisis, or are you doing research to say that that would prevent, say, manifestations like Lehman Brothers to fail? Okay. No, I, I, I am not myself. I mean, it could be, well be the case, but um, it, it's not a bad question, and, and it, it, uh, it, it's an interesting thing, and I, I just haven't thought yeah, about I mean, it. It's analogous to taking cold medicine when you have a cold. Yeah. You could get rid of your stiffly nose, right. cough. Right, the symptom. Cold. Right. But is the cold fundamentally that bad if you get rid of all the symptoms? Right. No, I understand your point. Uh, it's, it, it, it's something that, that's worth thinking about. Okay, last question. So. so you're saying it's difficult to engage policy reform. I see that because the data are not quite conclusive, yet there is a lot of policy reform yep. going on and institutions like us are being asked to, to help, and I think you're engaged in it, so what's the answer? <laughs> um, oh, I, <laughs> so there, there's one thing, I mean, as, as an academic, you're allowed to say, I don't know. Now, if, if, uh, if, if, you, if you're in, in a House of Parliament or a Congress or something like that, you have to have a view. So I, that, that's a, 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 the luxury that we have is, is because we have no power whatsoever. And, and, and that's, that's fine, but, but that's one of the reasons why I choose to be an academic. So. Um, <laughs> Okay, one, one last question. What's the website? <laughs> oh, it, website? Mine is easy. You Google Andy Rose on number one. There's <laughs> no one you don't have to worry about, about it, but it's, it's straight on, it's, it's on the Haas website. So. Thank you very much. We'll see you at lunch.